there. I mean, Josh Sweat has been he's been misutilized. He's been pretty silent for much of the season. He's a guy that the Eagles had a lot had a lot of high hopes for. They've extended, and I mean, the Fletcher Cox has been you know by and large a non-factor. Jalen Hargrave has been silent the past couple of weeks. I mean, I think that there has there has to be a way to get these guys going. They can't all be regressing all at the same time. All right, with the talent they have, if they tweak the scheme, what scheme would be better for the talent that they have? Well, I, I mean, I, I think you need to find a way to uh, be a little bit more aggressive and attack a little bit more, a little bit more blitzing and putting more uh, of a uh, putting more on the plate of the defensive backs that you have that aren't necessarily inexperienced. The communication uh, should be pretty much, you know, it should be pretty seamless at this point. And I, I think that you need to find a way to manufacture some sort of pressure if you're not getting home with your front four and taking and not letting a quarterback just sit back there and pick apart the short to intermediate areas of the field because they're a car is not the only quarterback that's done that with success. And the line, the linebackers aren't going to get any better this season. But you have to find a way to at least alleviate some of the pressure on their responsibilities by bearing down on some of these quarterbacks and, and finding a way to get them rattled. Because Derek Carr had all day back there to throw, and he didn't look like he was worried one bit about the defensive line or, or any sort of pressure. Not at all. Um, you know, John Gannon is a guy who – uh, obviously was a secondary coach with the uh, Indianapolis Colts. And you wonder, like, why does he not put – he? I agree with you, Andrew. His two most talented guys are his two corners, Nelson and Slay. Now, they're not – I mean, Slay is good. He's not, like, exceptional. He's good. Nelson's solid. He's not awful. I mean, these two guys are better than anything that this team has had for quite some time, right? I mean, these two guys, as you uh-huh. said, they – so – John Gannon, as a guy who's been in the secondary, does he not realize that those are his best two options right now with the way his linebackers are? Yeah, I mean, without question, those are the two most competent set of corners that the Eagles have had in years. And uh, well, he's got to get away from putting – I mean, his uh, Jeff, I was talking to Jeff after the game, and he, he alluded to the Jonathan Gannon playing his safeties in, in Reno because they were so far back and out of the action. He's got to – be more cognizant of the fact that teams are taking advantage of that and bring them down, uh, establish a physical element to your defense and, and play the run a little bit more effectively. If you're not, it, you can't keep in, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing with, and expecting a different result, right? So you have to find a way to manufacture some sort of pressure to uh, protect against the run because there's running lanes. I mean, you're making a guy like Kenyon Drake look like a world beater out there. I mean, that's just completely inexcusable. You're doing nothing to – uh, you're doing nothing to fill these holes. Uh, and, I mean, I think that um, you have to put more pressure on those corners and, and bring another safety up there to help against the run when that teams are clearly planning to attack them in that way. Yeah, I know that uh, the linebackers are a big problem here. Uh, but you do have some talent at the defensive tackle position. What are you making of this kind of back and forth between Fletcher Cox and now Nick Sirianni? You know, oh, I know Fletch is uh, frustrated. We're all frustrated. I'm frustrated. He's frustrated. But what is the message that Fletcher is trying to get out? And then John Gannon today essentially came out and, you know, yeah, Fletch is saying a lot of things that we should probably look into. Yeah, I mean, that's troubling because this is not the first time that Fletcher Cox has alluded to some of these uh, deficiencies on defense and uh, his uh, unhappiness with how he's being utilized. I think they need to find a way uh, to to have him in more of an attack-based scheme and uh, instead of a read-and-react passive uh, game plan every week because that's just not a recipe for success. I do think that that's a problem, though, Mike, when you're seeing some things like that slip out of the locker room or in a press conference in this situation. You worry about things starting to splinter a little bit because Jonathan Gannon has not shown uh, a willingness to alter his approach. And, I mean, if those last couple of uh, resounding losses aren't going to send off the alarms if you're Jonathan Gannon, then what is it going to take to make those uh, to make those corrections? Yeah, the <laughs> – one of the quotes that was brought up today um, that you just mentioned about what is it going to take to make the corrections, and it's what uh, the first question in John Gannon's press conference, which was, 
what's the accountability factor with Nick Sirianni? And Gannon says, you know, we're just in constant communication of, hey, what do we want to do to try to win the game this week? Well, to me, that is not acknowledging that we need to get better in the game that we just lost. What do we need to get better and fix in the game we just lost? Forget about what we need to do to win the game this week. What do we need to fix? And that tells me they don't know how to win. They don't know how to figure out. They're worried about what do we have to do this week to win? No, no, no. you got to well, figure out yeah, what you right. did when you lost. How you got to figure that out first? Right, and, and they're answering it correctly, but what you, you have to go by the actions, not necessarily the words. And the actions are telling you that they don't have the answers to correct these issues, and it's going to persist. It's going to persist for the rest of the season, because I mean, in, in my opinion, because if, if, here we are entering week eight, and the same issues that surfaced against the 49ers are still, you know, they're still glaring, and that's, I mean. I don't know that they have an answer for it. And it cannot be uh, saying that's the personnel is a cop-out because, like we've mentioned, there are some talented players on that unit. And even still, it's your job as a defensive coordinator to put these guys in position and make plays. 100%. I mean, that to me is, hey, I have poor linebackers. I need to put a scheme together to hide those guys, not put a scheme together to exemplify those guys. And it seems that he's saying, hey, I got the two worst players on my team, and I'm going to put the most uh, into their laps. Like, that to me is just malpractice the way they're doing that. And, hey, the proof is in the pudding. These teams are going up and down the field. The question I would have for you, Andrew, is of the two guys, Gannon Sirianni, who do you have more faith in as what you're seeing as – Hey, they're struggling. He's struggling, but they'll figure it out. I have more confidence that Jonathan Gannon will get it together because he seems to think that they're. I mean, he, he sort of conveyed that he's willing to listen to some of his veteran players. I mean, you have guys like Anthony Harris and Javon Hargrave and Fletcher Cox and Rodney McLeod, who's a fantastic leader. You hope that they that. They convey the message, hey, look, this is how you need to deploy us so that we can be successful and make plays for this football team. There's a lot of more veteran players there that I think that Jonathan Gannon will be receptive in, in listening to their input versus the offense. That There's a lot of youth and inexperience at the wide receiver position, and now you're down Miles Sanders. And, and not that he was really heavily involved in the game plan anyway, but I just early think Early on he was. Jonathan Gannon, what's that? Miles Sanders early on was heavily involved. Yeah, it only took seven weeks to do so. Right, right, right. But my point is is that there's a lot of youth and experience on offense and, and a first-year head coach. Obviously, Jonathan Gannon's in his first year as a defensive coordinator as well, but yeah. I think he's more willing, more apt to lean on the veteran leaders on that team. Yeah, and, and that, to me, that's a great point because to, we, I agree with you because what Sirianni is doing offensively is mind-boggling to me. I come in here Monday, and I can't believe how bad the game plans are, and we say it week in and week out. This team has young, skilled players. They have veteran offensive line. Their veteran player was Ertz, who's no longer here, but also Goddard. You threw the ball to Goddard. He had three catches, and he showed 23 yards a catch. That's your guy. Loosen things up with him and then allow the young players. It will help them get more separation, get more room to roam if they have to worry more about Goddard. But if they don't care if you're throwing the ball to Goddard because you never do, then it's just mind-blowing to me. I don't think Sirianni so far, other than the Atlanta game, Andrew, I thought he did a good job in that game. He can't figure out how to get Watkins the ball. He can't figure out what to do with Jalen Rager. I mean, to me, he seems like he has no idea what to do with the talent that is on this roster. And another thing that's very troubling is this offensive set of coaches that are on this team are very wide receiver-centric, including the head coach. So we've seen two penalties that wiped away touchdowns to receivers going out of bounds. We've seen uh, the the ineffectiveness of being able to scheme these guys open. And this is coming from guys who are well-versed in the wide receiver position, and they can't do it. I think sometimes he goes rogue. Well, not sometimes. Often, weekly, you see times of him going rogue and getting away from things that are successful, such as involving Dallas Goddard early in the game. Like, that worked against the Chiefs as well, but they went another direction. 
So he has not really shown me any consistency from a play calling standpoint for me to be comfortable or confident that he's going to be able to put the pieces together uh, for this final stretch of the season. Yeah, that's a, you know something I'm glad you brought up because it re- reminds me of they went under center, they turned around, they handed the ball off, and voila, Andrew, it worked. They went right down the field and scored. It set up play action. Like if I walked in, you said, Mike Gill, you are the head coach of this football team, or you're the offensive coordinator. This is your roster. Tell me what you think of it. And I'd say you got a play action team here. You got good tight end. You got a great offensive line. You got young wide receivers. This is a team that should be heavy play action, a lot of run. He's the act, exact opposite, except for when he did it, it worked. So why would he get away from it? I think sometimes, uh, at least I'm trying to put my put my you know, head coaching head on, I don't know if he's just second-guessing himself, if he's out, trying to outsmart himself, instead of just, you know, keep it simple. If this if the running game's working, Miles Sanders, for example, was averaging six yards a carry yep. before he left the game injured, rely on the running game. Don't get away from it. Dallas Goddard got open down the seam. The linebackers and the safeties, that was the area to exploit. That was working early on. Why do you deviate from that? And then all of a sudden, every week, it always Jalen Hurts is dropping back, rolling to his right. Uh, I should say escaping the pocket prematurely, rolling right. And defenses have caught on to that. But you keep going back through, you keep reverting back to these same things that are costing you games instead of going with your bread and butter, which is proving to be, a, I should say, the blueprint of running the football uh, to you know to set up the pass and help your quarterback. They're getting away from that, and I think sometimes Nick Sirianni is you know trying. He's outsmarting himself, or he you know he's just overthinking things. Um, when you listen to him yesterday, does it sound like a guy who has the answers? Does he sound like a guy who doesn't have that doesn't know what is the problem and doesn't know how to fix it? Do you feel like a guy who said, "Look, I'm young, I'm getting this, we're going in the right direction"? Do you see a guy who's lost confidence? Um, he took full accountability, which you like to see from a head coach. Um, you sort of look at the body language and the demeanor. I mean, if you're me, these are the things that I look at. And to me, you see a, a, a first-year head coach that has a lot of on his plate, almost overwhelmed at the way things have gone. Things are starting to spiral out of control. There's no veteran offensive mind there to really lean on as far as a coaching uh, on the coaching staff. So there's who's going to be able to – go to him and say, hey, coach, let's try this approach. Well, this is what's working. Uh, let me take a little bit off your plate and, let, and you know, let's try this for this upcoming week. I, I just think that um, there's no answers uh, moving forward. I mean, and, and I think that he kind of is at a loss right now. Um, and then, as you wrote about over at InsideTheBirds.com, Andrew DeCheck is with us here football at four. It doesn't help when Gainwell fumbles. Now, there's two things here. One – after Sanders left, it seemed that they decided not to go back to the run, but Gainwell fumbling certainly didn't help making him feel good about wanting to go down that route. My question is, though, they're using Gainwell wrong. Why is he carrying the ball? That's not his role on this team. Well, he's a running back, so he has to be able to do that. But, I mean, even still, how many times have you seen a running back fumble and the coach will go back to that player on the on the next possession to sort of instill confidence in them and get them rolling. He opted not to do that. Gamewell should be used as a pass receiving option. You know, at first and foremost, that's his primary skill set. But you also have a guy in Boston Scott who has done this before. He's a guy, he, I like the way that Boston Scott runs the football. He's aggressive between the tackles and he's not afraid to lower his shoulder and keep going despite his slight stature. Uh, he's a player that I think that you need to find a way to implement in the game plan until Miles Sanders is ready because um, I think that you have to find a way to utilize the, both running backs and, and their skill sets. But, um, you know, these are the problems, Mike, that when you're not uh, – your margin for error is so minute when you're a, a team like this, like the Eagles, with, that are so young and have so many glaring deficiencies that a fumble, all of a sudden you're, you're pressing and now you're trying to open the game with – open the second half with an onside kick. And you're giving a team who has moved the ball at will on you half the field to work with, and then Jalen Hurts fumbles. These things sort of spiral and tend to snowball for these type of teams. And, you know, this is just another classic example of of these self-inflicted wounds. You're right about that. Um, And right now, you know, Sirianni said yesterday, he's frustrated, I'm frustrated, we're all frustrated. He's right about that. But I think a lot of the frustration 
is coming from the way the team's being coached more than, hey, we're just getting out, we're getting our butts whipped because we're not. In in years past, Andrew, I felt this team was outmanned. They had injury problems. They had, you know, just not enough talent because of age and injury that had kind of wrecked the offensive line, um, wrecked units, the secondary ravaged. You're out, man. I don't feel that this team's out, man. I think they're under just out prepared. That's the pro. That to me is a huge problem. Yeah, they're they're coming out. I mean, they're coming out. I mean, this week they came out and scored, and but the defense is getting dominated in the trenches. I thought that the Raiders whooped the Eagles' offensive line as well. They just come out flat and unprepared, and that is a direct correlation to coaching. Yeah. And you're, so you're right. You're right there. There are enough playmakers on both sides of the ball for them to be better than what they've shown. Andrew, um, they trade Joe Flacco yesterday. I mean, obviously, they're, that, that's a win for them. They get the pick back that they traded for Minshew yesterday. I thought it was kind of interesting. Like you know, uh, Sirianni at the end, he's answering all these questions, and then he gets, hey, is Jalen Hurts, your quarterback, I'm not suggesting there should be or will be a quarterback controversy, but I guess my question is, would you be intrigued to see what this offense looked like with Gardner Minshew, a guy who has won in this league? Um, I, I, I suppose, but, you know, you sort of know what Gardner Minshew is at this point. And obviously moving Joe Flacco out bumps him up to number two, and you sort of wonder if Jalen Hurts is a bad half uh, you know, against the Lions for seeing Gardner Minshew in that offense. But at this, in, the, in the same vein, do you have any confidence in Nick Sirianni to work work with Gardner Minshew's skill set and cater to his strengths? He has not proven to be able to do that with Jalen Hurts. And this whole season was essentially a punt anyway. You're supposed to – it's all about evaluating. So I think that Jalen Hurts deserves a full season to see what he can do, what he can't do. And, um, you know, Gardner Minshew is going to be around – he's going to always – be in the conversation, but I think that you got to give Jalen the full season to see what he can do. All right, uh, Andrew Decheco, and uh, check out his piece over at InsideTheBirds.com about when he thought the floodgates opened in this particular game as the Eagles lose in Vegas. They'll play Detroit, and obviously we'll talk more about the matchups for Detroit and what a what would happen if you lose to an 0 and 7 team. What would that say about the state of this franchise? That's coming up on Thursday's edition of Football at Four with Andrew DeCecco right here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN. All right, Andrew, frustrating loss again. Well done on the breakdown. Thanks, man. Talk to you Thursday. Yeah, he's he's spot on on a lot of things, especially the John Gannon stuff. I mean, John and Gannon, to me, has to do a much better job. He is essentially saying – our linebackers are the worst part of our team, and I'm going to put the most in their plate. John Gannon today, he was asked a lot back and forth on the Fletcher Cox stuff. Tim McManus from ESPN said, speaking publicly, Fletcher Cox suggested pretty strongly that he doesn't agree with the way he's being deployed. How does that mess with your general philosophy that you shared with us? Your whole philosophy is making sure that you're bending the scheme towards the strength of the players. Gannon says he's got good points. I need to do a better job with him. Oh, here we go. Better job. Got to do a better job. You know, the Andy Reid line. John Gannon, it better change this week or your defense is going to get wiped up by an 0-7 Lions team. Sports Bash Live, 97.3 ESPN. Nick Sirianni, you're not absolved from this either. Hey, when we come back, it's the Find Five. Uh, excuse me, it's Tuesday. That means it's who's in, who's out. My 7-14, excuse me. Woo. My 14 NFL playoff teams after seven weeks. Who's in, who's out? The NFL playoffs. That's coming up next here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. 